Today I'm working on my 1972 Dodge Challenger and I'm going to be installing this radiator made by the guys over at Proform. This is supposed to be a bolt-in stock replacement radiator. As you can see it says it fits 1960 to 88 A and B body and then it also seems to fit 1970 to 74 E body. The most important part for me was that it was a passenger side inlet and a driver's side outlet. And when it talks about that, it's talking about its relation to the engine and where the water is coming from. So if we look at the engine real quick, where the thermostat goes, that's where the water inlet is. It leaves the radiator and it goes into the thermostat housing. From there, it runs through the water pump, it goes through the engine, and then an exit through the water pump outlet. Now on the radiator, that's actually reversed. Because water comes in to the thermostat housing, it has to leave the radiator on the top, and then where it leaves the engine on the bottom, it has to enter the radiator on the bottom. But not all engines are like that. For example, on the LS engines, they have the thermostat on the bottom, so it feeds in from the bottom, and then it has the outlet on the top. Where that makes things difficult is that if you're trying to source an aftermarket radiator for an application that does not necessarily belong to any single category, that's when you start to have problems. So where it says passenger side inlet and then driver side outlet, that only applies to the car that it's listed as here. So that's just one of those things you have to look for when you're purchasing a radiator. I believe there's actually an option to flip the inlet and the outlet of the same radiator in order to fit a different type of combination. For example, there are some water pump housings for the same engine that exit on the passenger side instead of the driver's side and in that case instead of running the passenger side water inlet into the engine you're gonna have to run a driver's side and there's just a bunch of little nuances so please pay attention when you guys are ordering your own radiators what i ended up doing myself is i called into the proform tech line and i said please make sure that the top inlet is on the passenger side and the bottom one is on the driver's side and then we had a little conversation about which one was which and whatever but I just needed them to make sure which one was which because that's exactly what I needed from them and I wasn't understanding how it was listed on the website. So for future reference when it says inlet or outlet driver passenger that's only in reference to the engine and the car that it's designed for. So that's enough of that. Let me go ahead and explain to you guys why I went with this radiator. And truth be told I already had a radiator, I already had an aluminum radiator and it's actually sitting right there on the floor there's nothing wrong with it it still works it's big it's high capacity it, i have my two cooling fans right now there's only one on it but i had my two cooling fans on it and it was working great so there is there any particular reason why i wanted to switch to another radiator so the reason for all this is that proform actually came up with a brand new design if you guys watched my sema showcase video from a few months ago they came out with a radiator that has a built-in fan and it's super slim it's only about i believe four inches front to back and that includes the radiator fan so i'm actually fighting a little bit of space i'm planning on running a serpentine belt drive and i can't have two radiator fans here in the way i've already double checked it and it does actually get in the way which is why first i took off one fan and now i ended up taking off the whole radiator with this setup i should be able to have more than enough room between the radiator and the new serpentine belt drive so just like my situation in the space department, this radiator has another set of features. So I'm gonna jump over to the installation instructions just so we can check something out. So on this diagram, we have a few things. Number one is we have a key code for the wires that come out of the connector that are leaving the radiator, which is right here. Of those wires, you notice that it's not just a simple power and ground installation. We have key on red, we have manual override blue, battery positive orange, ground black, and then at the top we have one that says air conditioning. So what this is, it's a trigger wire that comes from an AC unit so that when you turn your AC on, it will automatically turn on the fan in order to help cool off the condenser. If you don't have your system wired up to turn on when your AC turns on, then your future AC system is not going to perform the way you need it to. And so having something like this makes it really easy. Of course, you can do it without this, and it would just take a couple relays and a couple wires to get it done, but having the option built into the fan is always really cool. The last set of wires down here are actually in relation to the stuff that we have inside one of the covers on the fan. Normally, you don't actually have to touch any of this. You don't have to get yourself involved, 
but it's nice that you can keep the instructions for further reference and if you have to go in here and change the wiring or play with something that you're able to. The fan has a built-in thermostat so we don't have to wire or set up an auxiliary thermostat at all. This is all built into the unit. Included with the instructions is also a five pin harness with plenty of wire. So I should be able to finish this entire installation without having to add a single wire to this. But speaking of the installation, let's go ahead and jump in to see just how easy and how bolt-on this radiator actually is. So on my previous radiator, I had to make these adapter brackets. And, and the reason for that was because the radiator had two sets of mounting points, two on the sides and then two on the back. And so the two on the sides were too far apart. They were too wide. My brackets would have ended up back here somewhere. And the ones on the back were too narrow and it ended up like around right here and right here. So in order to make that work, I made these brackets. These brackets bolted the radiator into the stock location right here and then you would bolt the radiator right there and it worked fine i used that for many months i had a similar system on my 73 charger when i was running the exact same radiator and i had no issues i have no problems at all now that i'm moving on to a serpentine belt drive and now that i'm thinking about installing other things in the future i'm going to need a little bit more room and that radiator is going to give me the opportunity to do so all right so we're moving on to the installation portion Obviously the fan has to go that way. The fan should not face the front of the car. It should face the engine. So the mounting brackets face obviously the core support. So that's how I'm gonna go ahead and drop it in. I don't have any stops or tabs or studs in my core support. So I, there's no way I can do this without having to rely on just setting this thing. You're probably gonna want a buddy for this because I'm starting to realize that it's gonna be very difficult to try to hold this radiator up while trying to fit the bolts in. So uh, I don't have anybody around me right now, so I'm just gonna have to figure this out. All right, so I went ahead and grabbed one of my regular bolts. The radiator doesn't come with any kind of hardware, so you're just gonna have to source your own bolts if you don't have any. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just line it up right there and I'm gonna see if I can pick it up. The little mounting tabs have a elongated hole so I could scoot it over to one side. And it, right now it's resting on the frame rail. So we're all good there, let me grab another bolt. Now I can scoot it back to the other side. And the bolt does line up. So we're all good to go there. The bottom hole looks like it lines up. Yep, the bottom hole lines up on this one, but I don't think. So for this particular car, the bracket is too short. So the radiator stops right here and the bolts like somewhere down here. So the bracket, the factory, you know, little wing that comes off the side of the radiator isn't long enough to reach the bottom bolt. So what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to figure out which one of these slots to use to drill a new hole and run a bolt, which is not a big deal. And if you wanted to run it with three bolts, I don't see why you couldn't, but the instructions do say uh, right around here, they say use your existing hardware to secure the brackets to the chassis, two bolts on each side is recommended. So they're telling you to use two bolts. If you want to run three bolts, I think that's doable. But for me, I'm gonna run all four bolts. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drill a hole on this side over here, and then that's gonna give me my fourth bolt. So this is the hole I ended up drilling. This is the mount that I was talking about earlier. So it's too low compared to the radiator. Even if the bracket was to go all the way down, I don't even think it'd be able to reach. So here's the top one, and let's go look on the other side. So here's the top one on the other side. And as you can see, the passenger side bottom one sits higher than the driver's side bottom one. And that's probably because this radiator is actually shifted off to the passenger side a little bit on these cars, but it's fine. What I did was I just scooted the radiator all the way to the left a little bit until I could see where these holes were. And then once I saw where the slotted holes were, I kind of picked the bottom one. And then I aligned myself as best as I could and then just shot my shot and it looks like I made it all the way across. So now I'll go ahead and secure this radiator to the chassis. 
one, two, three, A, B, C, and the whole thing is completely installed now. As you can see, there's plenty of space between my radiator and my serpentine belt drive pulley. I went ahead and I mocked it up just to make sure I was gonna have the room, and there's about three inches in between there and the pulley, so we have plenty of room now. The last thing to do now is to finish the wiring portion, so let me go ahead and finish assembling the serpentine belt drive. Let me hook up some wires, and let's see if we can get this guy to run. Jumping over to the wiring portion, it's really not that complicated. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but really the only wires you have to look at are the top five right here, A, B, C, D, E, or in this case, B, A, C, D, E. It must have been some sort of typo, but the easiest one to identify is E. That's gonna be your black ground wire. So that can go to your chassis ground. That can go all the way back to your battery. This ground can go to the ground on your fuse box, to your PDM, to your ignition module. Anywhere really will work as long as it's a nice, clean, consistent ground that goes all the way to the battery. That's all you really need for the ground wire. The other four wires are kind of self-explanatory as well. You're going to need the main battery power, which is going to be D. That's going to be battery positive. That's going to be coming straight from your battery source or something similar. The majority of the amps are going to be running through this orange wire. So you're going to want to have as direct connection to the battery as possible. B is going to be your red wire or your key on wire. This is basically going to be your signal wire from your ignition switch. That's going to tell the fans that it's okay to turn on. If you would like your fans to stay running even when the car is off, you can wire in this one with your battery positive. And so anytime the engine reaches its maximum temperature, the fan will automatically turn on. But if you don't want the fan to randomly turn on, you're going to run this to your run circuit on your ignition switch. The last two wires are going to be wire A and wire C. Those are basically like bypass wires. For all intents and purposes, they do exactly the same thing. Wire A is going to be the easier one of the two to wire up. That's either going to go to the positive side of your AC compressor. That's going to go to your AC module. That's going to go to anything that will power on when your air conditioning system turns on. This will allow your AC system to trigger your fan. And so anytime the AC system is running, your fan is running. C is called manual override, and it basically does the exact same thing as the AC circuit. And as far as I can tell, I haven't found any real difference in fan speed between wiring it to A and C, so they must do almost the exact same thing. The only thing that I can say about this wire is that you can run this wire, like let's say into your cabin or to a switch, and that will turn on whenever that switch is turned on. So let's say you were trying to diagnose something, or let's say your engine's running hot for whatever reason, you have some sort of problem with the thermostat, you have a blockage in your radiator, or you end up running out of water, which causes your thermostat to not operate correctly, you can flip that switch and that'll trigger the manual override, which is the blue wire, and that'll automatically kick the fan on regardless of what's going on. The only real difference between A and C that I can see. Now in order to test this, we're gonna go ahead and wire in the ground wire to the negative battery terminal. And then we're gonna take wires B, C, and D and run those to the positive terminal. Doing it like this should allow me to bypass the thermostat and allow the fans to trigger on. I'm gonna be using my auxiliary battery to get this going because I don't have the main battery hooked up on the car since I have the thing apart right now. So uh, just connected the negative terminal and now I'm gonna connect the positive terminal. And we should see something soon. So as you guys saw, the fan did kick on when I wired in the ignition wire, the battery wire, and the bypass wire, in addition to the negative wire for the ground. I did notice that this fan has like a slow start feature, which keeps amps from being drawn all at once. Some of the other fans that I've had, like the one right over there, tend to kick on instantaneously, so it puts like a sudden spike against the battery and alternator and charging system. So with the slow start system, it tends to ramp up as it speeds up instead of trying to pull all the amps at once. But, but that's basically gonna cover the entire installation front to back. 
in another video i'm going to get more into the nitty-gritty of how to wire it what do i do to wire it so stay tuned for that i will see you guys all in the next one night wrencher signing out